Look, I think the fourth industrial rev revolution is, also, is already on us. It's not something that's coming in the future. It's a dynamic environment. And very practically, I mean, there are questions of the electric vehicle, driverless vehicles, uh, uh, transport data, big transport data, which is quite important for us. At the moment, we look at data manually almost, physically look at the figures, etc. But once you get them, you know, there's the systems in place, you'll be able to, to analyze big data the, you know, uh, on the thumb of your hand and, uh, and then to use it from a planning point of view. So I think there's exciting opportunities in, on the horizon, but there are huge implications for the way in which government organizes its work for the public service and then really the negative impact of possible unemployment as a result of technological innovation. So these are all aspects that I think we have to consider. And uh, I think the president in his speech at the State of the Nation has highlighted the importance of the fourth industrial revolution. And then, of course, modifying or amending or reforming the school curriculum so that the next generation of citizens that are emerging really are adept at the, at the technological you know, uh, instruments that are within, within their reach and to use technology as part of the development of our country. At any, any moment of, of uh, political change or elections will create a degree of uncertainty. But uh, from where I stand, it is in the ANC, we are quite certain about the future. I think we have a very coherent manifesto that we've put out, which begins to signal what the new policy direction is likely to be. And I think there are really four or five big issues there. One is, the most important issue is jobs and job creation. How can we create more jobs? How can we create more permanent jobs? and transport is a, is a potential growth point, transport sector. And I think we need to look at where, you know, how the sector can grow and actually create more jobs. Two is infrastructure development. It's absolutely pretty critical. We are an infrastructure department, both in terms of the road network, maintaining the roads, building new roads, but also building public transport systems so that people can move more efficiently uh, from home to work, etc. So if you have an efficient public transport system, that obviously has a positive knock-on effect on the economy, because you bring about greater efficiencies in terms of mobility, uh, both of commuters and also the general public. So there's a big space, I think, for, for infrastructure growth, uh, transport infrastructure growth in Kauteng. And then the key thing is to get the right skill sets. Uh, I think there's a shortage of transport planners in our country, in our province particularly transport economists. And there are also new job opportunities. Many people in black communities don't appreciate the diversity of jobs that are there uh, that within the broader transport sector. So I think all of those things need to, need to get out. And as you campaign for the elections, I mean, you also, it's not just about winning elections. It's about creating a vision, creating hope for the future. And I think we, we are on that path at the moment. Look, I think Gauteng One has shown us that it is possible to structure a successful Triple P project. Uh, it is a successful project, it has been implemented and rolled out, and the system is running at 98-99% efficiency. So it will match any successful rail system in the world. But really from a culture, from a behavioral point of view and a cultural point of view, we have to grow the public transport culture in our country. At the moment, we really uh, peak our service, so it's morning and evening. We have to grow the off-peak off ridership. And in the case of how train, the issue, I think one of the obstacles really in growing the ridership is the cost, the, the, the actual fees. So how train is modeled in a very simple financial model. It must be uh, lower, the price of the, of, 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 the, of the fare, the fare price must be lower than public Car, I'm sorry, private car usage and, and higher than taxi fares. So it's in that bracket. Taxi fare and the car, cost of driving your private vehicle is where you peg it. But it is, I think, there are questions of affordability, of accessibility. Can people who are ordinary working class people, can they afford to use the, uh, the Houtwain system? And I think for our future planning, we are looking at that so that the market opens up this greater accessibility and greater affordability.
We, we certainly are looking at it. I mean, both in terms of science and Department of Science and Technology and our department, we do have some you know, projects with, with people who are doing the R&D on this to see what will be the impact. I mean, we run a government fleet. Uh, we've got about 7,000 vehicles in G fleet. Of course, we've got to look at new technologies, cost efficiencies, uh, etc. So uh, I think it's all on the horizon. The biggest problem at the moment for us in the country is to get the new products on scale so that the cost structure comes down. But I think uh, the research is being done, the thinking is already in that direction. What came out clearly in President Ramaphosa's uh, build up to SONA is the launch of the infrastructure fund in terms of uh, preparing projects adequately before for investment. I think more attention needs to be paid to selecting the right projects. I think there's two types of infrastructure. There's social infrastructure, which I believe government need to take account of and do as their requirement in terms of the fiscus and provision of basic services to society. And then there's infrastructure that you can encourage private sector to invest in. Ultimately, private sector will want to return on their investment. Uh, we need to make sure that we hold private sector to account to not make uh, absorbent returns and there's an element of fairness in terms of reward. So there's got to be a reward because you've got to have a return. So I think it's about choosing that right balance. Often I believe that the private-public partnerships have gone wrong because we've selected inappropriate projects for PPPs. And, and that's where I think a lot more attention with the infrastructure fund should come to the fore. So my view is get the right people in those decision-making streams to assess the level of project preparation and to assess the right projects that will be brought to the market. At the moment, we definitely, aside from attracting more people into the industry, I think we need to prepare people correctly. So I think the, uh, as the president rightfully articulated, the challenge lies in maths and science at school levels. It's to create the right platform and right grounding so that we get the right crop of people entering engineering and then thereafter the challenges in terms of retaining them. And the only way you can retain people is to create a vibrant industry. We're seeing an economic de uh, decline, so there's a lack of work opportunities and it's not a case of people not wanting to train. I believe that it's, there is enough people that would like to train and pass on skills and knowledge, but I don't think there is the, the work space and the work availability out there to be able to afford to do this. Companies are currently doing the bare minimum in terms of just getting by and surviving. So I think the, uh, the, the advent of technology will, as the, as the MEC pointed out earlier today, will create uncertainty in terms of the job spectrum. But I believe if we focus our attention and education, we'll be able to reinvent, reskill, retool people. So it's pointless just sitting by and waiting for technology to pass us by. I think focusing on education to ready us for that view of reinventing, retooling, reskilling will place us in the position to be able to embrace technology. You know, CISA is a voluntary organization. We represent member companies. Our membership base is some 560 companies which offer services, credible, skilled, competent services to our clients. We believe the, the uh, advocacy and the awareness campaign in terms of highlighting value for money and looking at the components of infrastructure across its entire asset life Eskom and the current load shedding right now, I mean, I know there's been, uh, Minister Godan has pointed a finger at the construction sector and at uh, skilled design, uh, design and engineers. I think more attention needs to be paid to the maintenance regime. And the maintenance regime uh, resides in the right decisions being made in terms of resilience, sustainability, getting the best and most cost-effective solution over the entire lifespan of an asset not just the, the uh, cost, cost of prevent, uh, professional services or construction. That's the easy bit to evaluate. But really it's the 30 year lifespan that needs to be evaluated. And unfortunately the only people that can articulate those decisions are technically skilled people.
Right now we're not seeing enough technically competent people to evaluate the solutions being put forward by engineers like myself and other companies. And what we're saying is let CISA and organizations like ourselves help government, help client bodies capacitate technical teams of people. I said to the MEC earlier, in as much as you can't devolve politics from, from uh, technical decision making, you need to, you know, technical decision making need to be made by tech technocrats, people in, you know, with the right technical skills. Uh, at the moment, we're taking the few technically skilled people we have in government and we're making them politicians, and we're taking our politicians and forcing them to make technical decisions. Wrong mix. And I believe that's where we need to address it from a CISA point of view. So selfishly, from a CISA point of view, given that we, uh, we represent member companies, I'm hoping that we see a lot more money being invested in planning of infrastructure, a lot more money being spent, not in terms of just-in-time provision of infrastructure, because what we saw earlier today and what we've all been talking about, infrastructure doesn't just happen. The need is there for a long period of time. There's no reason why you can't design something, and even if you're not ready to implement, keep it on the shelf until you're ready to implement. So I would challenge government, rather design and prepare projects well in advance of the need. So rather have a good pipeline of work opportunities for consulting companies and for design houses. Twofold, it provides stability in the marketplace, but it also provides the right platform to bring in youngsters, to be able to train the future generation of engineers, and ultimately to drive our economy.